In June of 2019, the McMaster University Philosophy Department, with the generous support of the McMaster Socrates Project, convened a summer school on capitalism, democratic solidarity, and institutional design. An animating premise for the summer school is that Trump, Brexit, and similar ruptures across the globe are largely driven by stark inequality of income and wealth, exploitative employment relations, and non-responsiveness of nominally democratic political systems. A further idea is that some of the most renowned figures in political philosophy, such as Rousseau, Hegel, Marx, and Rawls, sought to design institutions and policies that would address problems such as these. The summer school seeks to contribute to the revival of this approach of philosophical inquiry, and to the important task of designing solidarity-promoting institutions capable of redressing current inequality and hierarchical domination that many communities are struggling with today. There's one concept, if, if, I, if I do anything else in this presentation, I want to clarify at least my understanding of this notion of democratic solidarity. Uh, and I, I, I have the suspicion that this idea is something can, that can actually, you know, through the lens of this idea, we might be able to uh, get a, hand, a little bit of a handle, not the complete story, but a bit of the story of what's been going on in the last 40 or 50 years or so. And the punchline is going to be that our capacity for democratic solidarity has diminished markedly in the last 40 years or so. Uh, but now what I want to do then is I want to, as I said, explicate this idea. And the primary, the, 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 the way I'm thinking about it is that this notion can be understood as, uh, as something like the, the, the democratic solidarity is the realized capacity to forge a general will together with others. And this idea, as far as I can tell, has its locus classicus, its ground zero, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use, in Rousseau. Rousseau uh, is the one that is the, the, yeah, the, the, the clearest early exponent uh, of this idea. And what I'd like to do, I, I think it's useful to get a handle on this idea, to start with Rousseau and you know, set out his general understanding of this idea, uh, and then uh, move on to Hegel. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to go too deeply into Hegel, but move on to Hegel, because he, I, you know, one of my punchlines is he's working with this same idea. Uh, and then if I have time, I'm going to say a bit about how, I'm going to point out where Marx actually, surprisingly, is working with the same idea, and then Rawls is working with this same basic idea. Each of these theorists is you know, uh, uh, developing their own spin on this idea. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile to point it out. It'll help us better understand the idea uh, to be able to assess its cogency and, uh, and maybe ways of working it out. I also think folks working in political philosophy in these areas today, I think a number of them are pretty clear descendants of this tradition. You know, they're the, they're the contemporary folks doing this same thing. And I think this is a... Uh, uh, a relatively discreet uh, and uh, distinctive thread uh, and way of doing political philosophy. And at least right now, I have the sense that it's a, worth, it's, it's a worthy pursuit. Uh, it's something that philosophers should be doing, and it's a way that philosophers might be able to contribute you know, through this tradition. Um, so, so what I'm going to do in the talk is I'm going to clarify democrat this idea of democratic solidarity, starting with Rousseau, uh, get as far as I can, Hegel, Marx, and Rawls. And then I think in doing that, that'll help clarify the general contours of what I'm going to call contemporary solidaristic design political philosophy. And in doing all that, I'm hoping I ha I'm going to put on the table a defeasible, no doubt incomplete, first statement of what we are doing here at this summer school. All right, that's the, that's the map, or that, those are the objectives. Let me jump in. And I'll just begin with Rousseau. Just say a few words about Rousseau that I think are relevant to the democratic solidarity stuff. Uh, yeah, he was you know, this 18th century polymath, composer, novelist, philosopher, accomplished in all these areas. Uh, the books I'm going to focus on here are The Discourse on Inequality, just a few passages from there, Social Contract. I'm going to say just a little bit about Emil, which is his book on moral education, which I think plays an important role in his whole, you know, his whole corpus. Um, he's born in Geneva, made his career in France. 
Uh, he's acknowledged by Kant, and this is really important for my you know, story about this thread. He's acknowledged by Kant, Hegel, Marx, and Rawls as a key influence. And I think once you start looking at things that way, you just see his thumbprints uh, 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 throughout all of these. Now, the key Rousseauian ideas I'll focus on here is the general will and the common interest. Those are companion ideas. I'm going to focus on the private will uh, uh, and the particular interest, another set of companion ideas. And I'm going to uh, also focus on this aspect of his moral psychology, his idea of this drive that he refers to as a more prop. I'll say what that is in a bit. And it relates to all this. A more prop is both an uh, engine and a possible impediment to the realization of the capacity of democratic solidarity. OK, now to get into uh, uh, Rousseau's idea of the general will, to kind of motivate it, I, I think we need to talk about uh, Rousseau's distinctive way of thinking about freedom. And Rousseau is extraordinarily complex and <laughs> many threads and strands. Uh, and so he actually has a lot of things to say about freedom. It's not clear how it all holds together, but I think here's one main uh, through line. He has uh, this idea of a key element of freedom is just not being, not having to bend to someone else's particular will. Uh, he has this idea as, of freedom as non-domination. Now in the discourse on inequality, uh, he, uh, he brings out, uh, uh, well he, he most clearly brings out this idea of natural freedom. And natural freedom is a way of achieving uh, non-domination, that is, you know, not, being, not having to bend to the particular will of somebody else. But the, the way you do that is in a context in which you're materially and socially independent from those others. You don't have to bend to their will because you're like a lion on the Siberian steppes, you, or not a lion, sorry, a tiger on the Siberian steppes, and you can just avoid them. You don't interact with them. And so you, you're not dominated by anyone else's particular will. You don't bend to their particular will because, uh, because you're in a context of independence. Uh, so that's the first half of the discourse uh, on inequality. He tells us that story. In the second half of the discourse on inequality and in the social contract, he, he, he's working with the same notion of freedom. Freedom is non-domination. But now the real trick is how can you get that kind of freedom in conditions of social and material interdependence. You can't, uh, you're, you're producing and living together with others, you're locked in to this relationship with others. How can you do that uh, and also uh, maintain this state of non-domination, that is a state where you're not bending to uh, the will of the others. Uh, his, his first move is to say, oh, this is how we do it. We, we uh, have a democratic assembly where everyone has an equal say with respect to uh, making the laws or the terms of social uh, interaction that govern uh, us. We each have an equal say. If we each have an equal say, then there's this possibility space of, of, being, uh, of, of all of us existing in a way that we're not dominated by any particular will. Uh, we make these laws together, we make these rules together. But uh, for Rousseau, that's not enough. Uh, it's not enough that there's just this, uh, this democratic form, uh, that there's this democratic procedure that gives everyone equal say. Uh, Rousseau's, one, a further idea that Rousseau has is that the members of this deliberating assembly, they must, uh, they must be idealized, idealized in a very particular way. They must satisfy an idealization condition. Uh, to get a handle on that idealization condition, let's look at what Rousseau says about the content of the general will. Now, what, this is really all he has to say about the content of the general will. It, in some ways, it's completely unsatisfying. But in other ways, I think it's enough to sort of set the table or the stage for the idea. It gets the intuitive idea across. Uh, sometimes I, in some moods, I'm like, oh, man, we need a much more fine-grained conception than what he's got. But in other moods, I'm like, wait, it's a mistake to try to give a fine-grained conception of this idea. It's better just to work with this rough and ready idea and apply it you know, uh, on a case-by-case, -case, uh, 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 in a case-by-case -case way. But here, let me read what he says. There's often a great deal of difference between the will of all and the general will. Uh, the latter considers only the common interest, while the former, uh, oh, you're going to have to sit in the middle. 
Uh, all right, or over here on the side. Uh, while the former takes private interest in those talents, and it's no more than a sum of particular wills. Okay, but here's what he says about the content of the general will. This is the, 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 the intuitively compelling, but also the unsatisfyingly vague uh, statement. But take away from these same wills, all these particular wills, the pluses and minuses that cancel each other, uh, uh, cancel one another, and the general will remains as the sum of the differences. And so, I don't know if this is very helpful, but here we have a whole bunch of private interests uh, and they all share a common interest and the idea is that the general will is tethered to the common interest. Uh, the general will is tethered to the common interest. And the idea is that the democratic assembly, uh, its objective, its collective objective should be to uh, make laws that are tethered to this common interest. Let me introduce one more passage from Rousseau that helps us see, uh, I, I think helps bring into view this idealization condition that he places on the democratic assembly. Uh, it's a passage that describes what happens when this idealization condition is not met. Uh, so in the social contract, in book four of the social contract, I've pulled out a few little passages. Let me just read them and then explain. He says, when the social bond begins to slacken, and the state to grow weak, when particular interests start to make themselves uh, felt, and the smaller societies begin to influence the larger one, the common interest changes and comes to have opponents. The general will is no longer the will of all. When in every heart the social bond is broken, and when the meanest uh, interest brazenly helps itself to the sacred name of public good, the general will falls silent. All men guided by secret motives stop giving their views as citizens, that is, folks with their eye on the general will or the common interest, and wicked decrees directed solely to private interest get passed off as laws. Um, so, 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 so what is Rousseau saying here? Well, what he's worried about, what he's cautioning against, uh, is the possibility of a democratic assembly whose individual members are not deliberating with the common interest in mind. They're actually just looking for a way to jockey in this forum to impose their particular interests on everybody else. So the idealization condition for Rousseau is a kind of uh, attitude, a disposition to conform one's will, one's uh, private interests, to the common interest. Um, so here, let me, now I think I'm in a position to just give us uh, an initial statement, a recapitulation of, Ro of Rousseau's conception of the general will, which is also going to be my conception of democratic solidarity. The general will is embodied by the enactments of a democratic assembly under the following condition. All, or at least most members of the assembly, realize the capacity, it's a twofold capacity, to grasp the common interest, and two, to subordinate or conform her you know, their respective private interests to the common interest. And then they uh, vote for, you know, some prospective law on the basis of that disposition. They have realized what I want to call the solidaristic capacity. They think of themselves as a we, not as, an, as a collection of individual folks. They think of themselves as a we with a common interest that stands in a, in a privileged relationship to the private interests that diverge from that common interest. Uh, Rousseau, or, uh, the members of such a democratic assembly realize what I'm going to call the value of democratic solidarity. Alternatively, we might say they realize the value of interdependent non-domination uh, or Rousseauian civil freedom. Okay, so there is the stage setting. I think uh, a key value <laughs> that's at stake right now is this capacity. And the, one of my thoughts is, for whatever reason, we've, there's been a marked decrease in our ability to form a general will together, and we've started to decay. It's not like we are fully like that, but we've moved in this spectrum more to a, to a society that looks more like a society of warring private interests as opposed to a society where a, a, a lot of us, at least, are uh, focused on a common interest and are disposed to, you know, just act reasonably and like cabin your private interests under the umbrella 
sorry, I mixed metaphors, but under the, <laughs> under the larger house uh, 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 of the common interest. All right. So now I think we have a project. I think we have a philosophical project that's going to you know, necessarily go hand in hand with, uh, it's going to necessarily be interdisciplinary. Uh, the, 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 the part that's in the wheelhouse, I think, of the philosophers is to clarify this, the content of the general will, this idea of what the general will is. Because that's, that's, that's the value story, that's the narrative story, that's the conceptual story, that's the thing that philosophers are supposed to be particularly good at. Um, and then, but now very quickly, everything else we do, we need to bring social scientists along with us. We need to identify impediments to the realization of the solidaristic capacity. We have to identify or imagine the institutions and policies that foster and enable the realization of this capacity. And, and this is a different thing than just coming up with institutions and policies, we also have to devise feasible uh, political programs to get those things implemented. And you know, we can fail <laughs> at any step of this way. This is a hard project. Institutional design is not easy. All right, so, but, so I think now we've got the outlines of a project. Um, and I think it's a project, I mean, this is sort of news to me. Uh, I, I fear what Bill Edmonds and Alan Thomas are thinking. I don't think it's news to those guys. They, they've been doing something like this, I think. Okay, now what I want to do is uh, just to help bring the idea into further view and to maybe bring this project into further view, I want to say a little bit about what Rousseau had to say uh, about the key impediment to the realization of the solidaristic capacity. And it's not so much to say that he was right, though I do think what he said was very compelling, but just to give you the, an, an idea of the kinds of things that might be impediments. And then also uh, to come to better understand you know, his ideas of what uh, the motivation for, why, for, for the various things he introduces as part of the solidaristic project, the uh, institutions and policies he, he pushes uh, 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 it, it, to further this project. OK, so the key impediment is this notion of a more pro for Rousseau. Now here I'm following. I, I, I'm, I'm following an, an interpretation that's been given to us by this guy, Frederick Neuhauser, where Frederick Neuhauser, he forefronts this notion of uh, more probe as kind of the animating idea of just about all of Rousseau's work. Uh, so what is a more probe? Well, first, a more probe, it's this drive that rests on, as, you know, as far as we can tell, is a un uniquely human capacity. It's this uniquely human capacity to take the second person perspective with respect to ourselves. We can have this idea of someone else evaluating us. So that's a pretty complex cognitive ability. Uh, I don't think my cat has it. Well, yeah, my cat definitely doesn't have it. My dog might have it. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but, but anyway, so this is, but, but I, I think my dog probably doesn't have it. But it's this, uh, it's this, this complex capacity uh, to take this second person evaluative perspective and close this door. Um, now, once you have that capacity, uh, that is a condition that enables a particular kind of desire or drive. And this desire or drive, and, and Rousseau thinks this is fundamental. Like there's, you cannot get this out of a person. You know, maybe the Dalai Lama doesn't. You know, maybe he's managed to get rid of this or something. But, uh, uh, but by and large, you cannot weed out this drive. And this is, it's this drive to be esteemed by others from that perspective. Um, now, a, an important feature of this drive, uh, and Rousseau's thinking about this drive, is this idea that this drive is protean. It's kind of amorphous and can be taken different directions. And two of the main directions that I want to talk about today, and I think motivate uh, a lot of Rousseau's work, is it could be taken in a direction that we might call inflamed. That's that's Neuhauser's term that he gives to Rousseau. Inflamed amor propre, where you're you're, what that drive demands is to be esteemed as a superior. And to give a little bit more flesh to that idea, it's a uh, drive to be esteemed as someone whose say counts for more than others. Uh, and, who, and, and also to be esteemed as someone whose interests count for more than others. Uh, if you read Anderson, 
uh, she calls that second manifestation uh, standing. It's a demand for superior standing that one's interests count for more. The first manifestation is a demand to be authoritative, to have authority over others. Um, but another way this can go, uh, thinks Rousseau, is this drive can take a form where it's a, it's a drive to be esteemed as an equal. Where, you know, you, the way it gets satisfied, and one, one's character gets cultivated in a way to where it's perfectly satisfied so long as your esteem is, uh, 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 you're esteemed as an equal. You're esteemed as someone whose interests count the same as everyone else's, and whose say counts the same as everyone else's. So Rousseau thinks that the, these are two ways this drive can go. The drive's ineliminable, you've got it, it's got to go, maybe it goes the inflamed way, and it, or maybe it goes the egalitarian way. Um, all right, so to say a little bit more, this is gonna appeal to everyone over 40 uh, in the room uh, and no one else. Uh, so here's a, a more probe on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> oh, and probably people not from the UK. <laughs> who didn't watch reruns of Gilligan's Island. Uh, but it's an easy story to tell anyway, and it's got pictures. Um, so just a little bit about Gilligan's Island. Seven people, seven castaways, stranded in a Pacific island. No one can find them, they're shipwrecked. There's different characters. I'm not gonna talk about all seven characters. I'm gonna talk about three. There's Mr. Howe, a millionaire that for some reason was traveling with these seven jokers. Uh, uh, and there's Mr. Howe's wife, but we're not gonna talk about her. She, she and, and he goes a package. There's the skipper, who, you know, is the captain of the ship. And there's Gilligan, who's the first mate. If you remember the Anderson, uh, just to kind of preview the Anderson article, uh, she talked about uh, the, the, this idea that there's a mudsill of humanity. Well, Gilligan's the mudsill uh, uh, of Gilligan's Island. Um, all right. So, so you have these people, and they have these common interests in material prosperity and leisure. Uh, and there's a prospect of working together to extend the material prosperity leisure frontier. If they work together, they can get a lot more time off and they can get a lot more coconuts or you know, something like that. Um, as opposed to just trying to each do it on their own. All right, but now they need to organize themselves. And how are they going to organize themselves? How are they going to distribute these tasks? Um, now, I think Rousseau's idea is that there are two kinds of social equilibria that are possible. And in fact, at his time, the second one hadn't been realized yet. He was hoping that maybe we can get something like this. Um, but uh, the world he saw was this first one. It's a hierarchical and precarious inflamed social equilibrium. And at the top, you know, you've got Mr. Howe with inflamed amor prope. I, 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 this isn't really how the plot goes, but let's imagine. Uh, Mr. Howe, you know, his, his interests count for more. His say counts for more. There's the skipper. He's in this intermediate zone. He, his interests count for more than Gilligan's. Uh, and uh, and uh, his authority, he, you know, Gilligan has to do what he says. But he's all, ruled by uh, uh, Mr. Hal. And then Gilligan's the mudsill. He's the, he's the guy at the bottom. Now, the idea is that there are a lot of social equilibria that look like this, uh, where people, uh, people in all these middle ranks they uh, have fostered this inflamed version of a more probe, and you know they have to take it from the people above them. But at least they get to kick their dog. You know, at least they get to get their more probe satisfied in these other contexts. And this thing can hang together in a really ugly and precarious way. One thing to mention, uh, I think, that's relevant is something that that Rousseau would point out, and I think you can see it intuitively. Uh, I, at least I think I see it intuitively. This drive to be esteemed, no matter how it's manifest, if it's thwarted, if it's not satisfied, people have a tendency to react violently. This, this, this is what causes revolutions and wars and murders and that kind of thing. Yeah, it gets you shot in the south side of San Antonio, where I'm from. Uh, uh, this, this is a powerful drive. And the way this drive can you know, embroil us uh, in this hierarchical and precarious and flame social equilibrium, I think the kind that Rousseau thought he was living in. But then there's this possibility of an egalitarian equilibrium, one where everyone uh, seeks to be esteemed as an equal. They live under something like a democratic assembly where everyone has an equal say about you know, how uh, you pursue material uh, 
goods and leisure on the island, uh, and everyone gets, uh, uh, everyone's interests count roughly the same. Uh, now, back to a more probe, a more, a more probe as an, uh, as an impediment to the realization of democratic solidarity, I think it should be pretty clear. Uh, if you have a society uh, w that has gone the inflamed direction, what's been acculturated, the predominant or the prevailing manifestation of a more probe is the inflamed version, well, you're n the capacity for democratic solidarity is just precluded. That's just not something that can be realized. Uh, the only chance to be able to do this is if you cultivate it broadly in the population uh, this, this egalitarian version of a more probe. Um, okay. So, so Rousseau then, so one thing I think to keep in mind when reading Rousseau's work, uh, he is devising a number of institutions that he thinks are going to be outlets for egalitarian amour probe. And, and they're, they're not just going to be outlets. I, I think he has this idea that there's a kind of moral educated function of these institutions where they will instill, I mean, they don't have to say it explicitly, but just their existence and people's participation in them will cultivate and foster uh, this, this other version of the drive. And a real danger is that we don't have outlets like this and institutions performing this moral education function because then that drive's gonna get fostered and cultivated in some other way, the way we don't like, the one that leads us to this in, inflamed and precarious hierarchical world. Um, I think with this idea of a more probe in mind, this is also, this helps us understand why Rousseau thought constraining wealth inequalities was really important. Because if wealth inequalities do anything for you, what it does is it puts one set of folks in a position to buy the obedience of other sets of folks. And now they're going to live in these relationships that are embodying and encouraging this inflamed manifestation of a more pro. Uh, so, uh, all right. One final thing I'll point out is I think now, by, by you know, thinking about Rousseau in this way, we can see how his book, Emile, if any of you folks are familiar with this, fits into his work. Emile is just this gigantic work uh, that's dedicated to how do you bring someone up. And book four of Emile, if you look at it, it's all about cultivating, a, he doesn't use this phrase, but he makes this the same distinction, cultivating egalitarian more probe as opposed to inflamed. So, you know, Rousseau thinks we've got to do all this. We've got to do whatever we can to weed out the bad kind of a more probe and foster the other kind. All right. So that's, that's all I have to say about Rousseau. Hopefully I've set the stage uh, uh, for, for our discussion of democratic solidarity. Let me throw in a bit of, let me talk about Hegel. And like I said, if that doesn't take too long, maybe I'll say a few words about Marx and Rawls, how they sit in, fit into this picture. Um, but I've got to do Hegel because the one joke in the whole paper rests on doing the Hegel bit. <laughs> All right. So um, let, let, me make, let me make a quick contrast bef before pivoting to Hegel because I think now we're in a position to see this idea. We might distinguish between what we could call Madisonian republicanism and Rousseauian republicanism. Uh, Madisonian republicanism uh, it, it, here's what it tries to do. It tries to put into place an institutionalized system of checks and balances designed to ensure that no faction can dominate another. Uh, and, so, and so James Madison, one of the founding fathers, one of the authors of the Federalist Paper, and Federalist, paper, uh, Federalist, papers, uh, Federalist Paper number 10, you know, he trots out the system of checks and balances, and it, you know, it pits faction against faction so no one can dominate. Uh, I don't want to push things too far. I'm sure Madison was thinking about character as well, but at least on the page, what it looks like is we have a kind of mechanical uh, you know, uh, constraint of opposing wills. So I think Rousseau, the Rousseauian project, accepts that. that. That's part of what needs to be done when we're designing political institutions. But Rousseau's project, I think, forefronts in a way that uh, Madison doesn't, that the, uh, and other Republicans don't, the importance of designing institutions that inculcate a certain character such that persons are not uh, strongly inclined or disposed to dominate. 
that, that they're not as, as inclined to uh, try to Im just impose their particular will on others. They're more, they're more likely to, to be reasonable, to, to, uh, to, to argue with others in terms of a common will or a, or a common set of interests. All right. Now, the pivot to Hegel. So Hegel's this, uh, he's an early 19th century German-speaking philosopher. He's, he's, he's in roughly what we might call Prussia. He lived in a, what, what we could call a proto-capitalist political economy. Um, if any of you folks read the Anderson piece, he was living at a time period where, we hadn't, where the Industrial Revolution hadn't taken off yet. Uh, you, you're getting markets, markets for exchange of goods and services, but you don't have the factories and the satanic mills and that kind of stuff yet. Uh, so he lives in this proto-capitalist political uh, economy, the late stage of a transition out of feudalism. Um, what I want to talk about, what, what I want to do to kind of bring Hegel's solidaristic ideas to the fore, I want to just briefly reference Hegel's conception of freedom of the good and the good. And I think what we'll see there is something that structurally parallels Rousseau's idea. Uh, in the same ballpark. I want to talk about Hegel's conception of evil, uh, which I think is very interesting. Very, uh, 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 and then I want to talk about the rabble and the rich man. They might be evil on Hegel's account. They're at least shameless uh, on, on Hegel's account. OK. So let me read the Hegelese, and then I'll translate. Uh, and basically what I'm going to say is when you translate it, it it's Rousseau. Um, uh, so what Hegel says is welfare has no validity. He says this in philosophy of right, by the way. Uh, welfare has no validity for itself as the existence of the individual and particular will. Okay, here, I think he just has this idea of a private interest and a particular will. And his thought is the pursuit of that private interest or that particular will, it has no validity in itself. Rather, it only has validity. It's only something that's a choice-worthy objective, uh, only, only if it's pursued as an instantiation of, uh, of universal welfare, something that's compatible with the common interest, to translate this into Rousseau talk, uh, but only as universal welfare, and essentially as universal in itself, uh, in accordance with freedom. I think he's thinking of Rousseau's idea of freedom here again. Uh, welfare is not a good without right. Similarly, right is not the good without welfare. Okay, now let me say a little bit about right for Hegel, what Hegel's thinking about right. I don't think it's what most people today will naturally think when they hear this word. What's Hegel thinking about when he's talking about right? He's thinking about something concrete, something embodies. He's thinking of a system of property and contract rights that constitutes, well, the marketplace in which, e which folks in this proto-capitalist society are able to secure, it, it's a man he's thinking about, uh, each of these persons is able to secure his uh, family's welfare uh, by way of exchanging his labor uh, or goods that he and his family have produced for material necessities. So there's this system of rights, contract and property rights, that makes it possible to enter into free exchange of goods and services for uh, material necessities. And that's a new thing. That's a recent development. That's progressive. That's at the cutting edge of social possibilities in Europe at this time. Um, and and the, uh, his idea is that this system of rights is a system of rights that makes it possible for each participant in that system of rights to achieve their own welfare in this marketplace. And they get a lot of goodies uh, in this marketplace. So Rousseau has this idea, he, I'm not sorry, uh, Hegel has this idea, he uses this word civil society, and when he uses that word, he's thinking, what, what he's referring to is a marketplace where each secures his family's welfare. He has this patri you know, patriarchal notion in mind. that he's the head of the family, it's a man, and he goes out and, and he wins these goodies. And these people, they, these, these men, they get a lot of stuff in this marketplace. One thing that happens to them is that just by, by, by being out there in the marketplace, uh, trying to secure material necessities by selling you know, your, your services and your goods, it, make, it turns you outward. It makes you attentive to the interests of others. It makes you look away from your own particular interests 
to the interests of others to try to figure out, okay, what do they need? What do they want? Uh, and that's a little bit of cultural development that's necessary for this altruistic capacity, I think, uh, thinks Hegel. Uh, you win, you get some really good stuff here. You get uh, recognition as a breadwinner, an occupant of a valued station in the division of labor. Here, uh, you're going to have folks that are artisans, they're you know, maybe bridal, I'm going to just make a bunch of stuff up here. Bridal makers, we, uh, 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 blacksmiths, uh, wheelwrights, uh, any other cartwrights, any other last names that might fill in the blanks. Uh, uh, but you get the idea. Bunch of artisans, uh, you know, dock workers of some sort, on and on and on, uh, that are plugging in the division of labor in this very individualistic way. No factories, very few large mass workplaces. Uh, and then, this is really important for Hegel. Hegel thinks that people that are in this marketplace trying to exchange their goods with one another, what's going to be instilled in them is this ethos that recurs in the philosophy of right. Be a person, respect others as persons. And roughly what that means is uh, just be a part of this group that mutually recognizes one another's equal rights, as, uh, e uh, equal status as rights holders, bearers of contract and property rights. Okay, now Hegel uh, describes uh, another cultural institution, the state. Uh, the st and he thinks of the state as a forum for grasping that the state's regime of rights uh, serves the common interest and that the common interest is continuous with one's own. So Hegel partly imagines and he partly reflects on the institutions that exist at his time, and he says, hey, here's a way that we sort of do it now and we really should do it you know, in a more focused manner. We should organize ourselves into corporations where a corporation is basically like a trade group. All the bridal makers, you have your group. All the uh, you know, cart rights, you have your group. All you dock workers, you have your group. You have a unified set of interests. Now you elect the persons you trust the most in your you know, line of work to go represent you in the deliberative assembly where the laws are made that adjust this regime of contract rights and property rights. We trust you to go do this, but also you're going to do this in a political sphere in which uh, there's freedom of, public, uh, there's freedom of uh, speech and there's, you know, there's free, he uses the term, the translation is public opinion. There's freedom of public opinion. And so we're going to talk about what you do. We're going to say a bunch of stupid stuff at the cafes about what you do. Uh, and we're probably going to get it wrong, but we're going to feel involved. And we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, just develop this community ethos. Uh, Hegel's idea is that these two sets of cultural institutions, they perform a really important function. What they do is they create people uh, who have mediated their particular interests with the universal welfare. They've mediated their private interest with Rousseau's uh, common interest. They've become a part of a universal as opposed to a solitary uh, pursuer of their private interests. Okay. So what's evil for Hegel? So Hegel, he uses these same notions, these same concepts. Uh, I'm going to read it and I'm going to translate it again. But maybe I won't have to do so much translating this time. Maybe I've brought you along a little bit. So the self-consciousness, well, that's just like any person <laughs> who's thinking. Uh, the self-consciousness is capable of making into its principle either the universal in and, in and for itself or the arbitrariness of its own particularity, given the latter precedence over the universal and realizing through its actions, uh, i.e. it is capable of being evil. So what's the evil person for Hegel? The person who chooses to... Uh, uh, to, to go beyond or to ignore the constraints of the general will or the common interest and, and who just seeks, who doggedly or stubbornly seeks to impose their particular wills, unalloyed or untempered by the common interest. That's the evil person. Um, all right. Now the rabble. The, uh, re re interestingly, Hegel doesn't use the word evil to describe the rabble, but he gets close. Let me tell you what the rabble is. What the rabble is. For Hegel, the rabble is a poor person who is unable to secure uh, his needs in the marketplace for whatever reason. So he, he, he doesn't win all these goodies in civil society, exchanging you know, uh, in that sphere. He also doesn't get represented in the political process. Uh, 
this, so what, what's, what the, the problem of the rabble for Hegel is we have these people who have private wills that have not been mediated. There's no cultural possibility. There's no mechanism to mediate their private wills. Uh, so here's what he says. The poor are subject to yet another division, a division of emotion between them and civil society. The poor man feels excluded and mocked by everyone, and this necessarily gives rise to an inner indignation. Uh, because the individual's freedom has no existence, and here freedom is realizing your own private will in a way that's continuous with a universal or a, con a general will, because the individual's freedom has no existence, the recognition, recognition of universal freedom disappears. From this condition arises that shamelessness that we find in the rabble. Here you have this set of persons who, do not, who are made indignant by the constraints of the universal. Uh, the, 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 the thing that, that houses the universal welfare of everyone else, the scheme of property rights and contract rights, uh, turns the rabble into thieves. Because <laughs> the only way they can, get, they can meet their material needs is by theft, deception, or charity. They're, they, 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 they are made indignant by the universal. The universal is something with which their particular interests are at war. There, they, there's no mechanism that makes their particular interests continuous with the interests of the universal. Okay, now here's a really interesting thing, I think. Hegel thinks that there are certain kinds of rich men that stand in the same structural position to the universal welfare. Uh, so here's what Hegel says. On the one hand, poverty is the ground of the rabble mentality, the non-recognition of right. On the other hand, the rabble disposition, disposition also appears where there is wealth. The rich man thinks that he can buy anything because he knows himself as the power of the particularity of self-consciousness. This wealth can lead to the same mockery and shamelessness uh, we find in the poor rabble. I think shamelessness here is close to his notion of evil in both cases. The great wealth uh, puts persons in a position to where, look, I don't need your system of rights. I stand outside of it. It's getting in the way, actually, of my realization of my interests. It's not furthering me. My interests aren't continuous with that. So now, I'm going to be a threat <laughs> to your, because I also have power. I'm going to be a threat. And, and, and even worse, there's a whole set of rabble who are kind of on my side, too. <laughs> Because they see this whole thing as a bunch of, uh, 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 or they see it as hostile and alien. I won't use the Texanism to describe it. Uh, they see it as hostile and alien. They see the system of rights as hostile and alien. Uh, so Hegel says these two sides, poverty and wealth, thus constitutes the corruption of civil society. All right. Um, that's, what I, that's what I have to say about Hegel. I think I have time to say a little bit about Marx and Rawls. I'm getting a little tired of hearing myself talk. Um, I'm going to go for it, though. And uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go for it. And I'll try to keep it light. So something. So 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 I think Marx is in the same tradition, and at least early Marx is in the same tradition. Uh, the Marx who's writing in the 1840s. Uh, in, on the Jewish qu qu question, one of his essays from, from this time period, he cites Rousseau, a passage from Rousseau favor favorably. And it's a passage from Rousseau where he's just trotting out the same stuff I've been talking about for the last 30 minutes. Uh, so he, he cites favorably this notion of a political man uh, that's formulated by Rousseau. The political part isn't favorable, but there's an ideal here that I think Marx endorses. So here's what he says. Here, here, here's the passage from Rousseau. This is also from the social contract. Whoever dares undertake to establish a people's institutions must feel himself capable of changing, as it were, human nature. We just talked about that, instilling this democratic, or this solidaristic capacity uh, itself, of transforming each individual who in isolation is a complete but solitary whole into a part of something greater than himself, from which, in a sense, he derives his life and his being, a substitu substituting a limited and moral existence for the physical and independent life. OK, the so, uh, uh, so Marx is saying, yeah, you know, that solidaristic capacity, that's a good idea. 
But here's the thing that Hegel and Rousseau get wrong, thinks Marx. Uh, it's a mistake for them to think that that mediating, this forging of this solidaristic human, is something that can happen uh, uh, just in the political sphere. It's something that has to happen on, on an everyday basis, in the economy, in the everyday social relations. Uh, it can't be something that's abstract, sort of like a, a heaven on earth, like a, you know, that's the last thing I would think of, uh, you know, of parliament, but you know, <laughs> but that's the idea. Uh, it's this heaven on earth that, that you, you never really visit. Uh, so here's what Marx says. Human emancipation will only be complete when the real individual man has absorbed into himself the abstract citizen. So he likes the idea, Rousseau's idea of the abstract citizen, uh, but, but real people have to absorb it. When, as an individual man, in his everyday life, in his work, and in his relationships, he has become a species being. And when he has recognized and organized his own powers, his social powers, so that he no longer separates the social power from himself as political power. He's achieved, he's realized this capacity for solidarity. Okay. Now, Marx has a further idea. He has this further idea that up until his, you know, his, his time and place, uh, you, know, 19th, uh, uh, you know, late 19th century capitalism after the Industrial Revolution, it's not, you can't get a people who's capable of solidarity. You can't get a people who's capable of forming a general will together. Now, why is that? Well, it's a, it, it's a pretty simple thought. His idea is up until that time, you had different economic epochs that are characterized by divisions of labor with differentiated roles in the divisions of labor. In feudal times, you might have folks who own the lands, and then you have other folks that all they can do is work the lands. You have nobility and serfs. You have these differentiated roles, you have differentiated interests. And what you also have, it just tends to happen this way, that with these division of labors, there'll be some set of folks that are gonna occupy the catbird seat. I don't really know what that word means, but I think what it means is that they're in a position to impose what they want on everybody else. The nobility, because of where they fall in this division of labor, they, they just have the capacity to impose uh, their interests on everybody else. And then Marx has a whole bunch of the German ideology about how they can also generate ideologies, they have a lot of time to you know, do all kind, perform all kinds of little tricks, not just force, to get people to go along with, uh, with them. And he thinks, you know, any, epoch up until his time, economic epoch, uh, just until his time is going to have similar features. Capitalism is the same way. You've got the capitalists who own, you know, it's 1% of the folks own all of the means of production, and then they're in this position to you know, get the other 99% that all they have is their labor power to sell to do just basically anything they want. Uh, and they will, and they do. And so, so uh, Marx's critique is that, look, when you have economies like that, you're just not going to get people who are capable of, uh, in a non-ideological or a non-confused you know, way, uh, going after a true common interest, a true general will. But there's a solution. The institution that provides the solution for Marx is capitalism. The meat grinder of capitalism. What it does is it turns all the people into this undifferentiated mass of workers who don't really have either the capacity or a unified interest that distinguishes them from one another. Everyone just basically has their labor power to sell. They're, they're similarly positioned. And so Marx thinks that uh, it's, that it's uh, well, here, I'll read it. The proletariat, that's the, that's the class of folks in late stage capitalism that just has their labor, uh, uh, their labor to sell. The proletariat itself can again only be a universal and through a revolution in which on the one hand the power of the earlier mode of production intercourse and social organization is overthrown and on the other hand there develops the universal character I think that's the solidaristic capacity uh, and the energy of the proletariat now you finally it's the crucible of capitalism in which you forge people that are capable of forming a, uh, a general will together one that's not really uh, uh, surreptitiously governed by some factions, private will. All right. Done with Marx. Let me recapitulate. So, 
Rousseau gives us a couple of institutions and policies that he thinks are necessary to foster the solidaristic capacity, the democratic assembly, and constraints on inequality of wealth. Rousseau says the key impediment to doing this is this thing inflamed more probe. Hegel gives us some institutions, civil society, the marketplace, and the deliberative state, where he thinks uh, people, uh, uh, those are the institutions that forge this solidaristic capacity. Uh, and the threats are, well, being acculturated in a way that places you outside of uh, the universal interest. And then finally, Marx uh, uh, thinks it's the capitalist crucible that forges the proletarian. That's uh, this, this group that's capable of forming a general will together. And the thing that he's mostly worried about is class-based warring private interests, class antagonisms. All right. Whew. Potted history. Uh, I'll just say just a little about, uh, about Rawls, Rawls uh, and I'll just let it go. Rawls has this notion of the reasonable. And it's a vexed and contested notion or at least, you know, there's, 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 I don't know how many papers, many, many papers, you know, trying to make sense of this idea of the reasonable. And something I'd want to propose is that it, at its heart is Rousseau's idea that reasonable people are people who are, are, reason, are realizing this solidaristic capacity. And let me give you a little bit of textual evidence uh, for thinking about the reasonable that way. So in political liberalism, Rawls uh, says some words about what reasonable is. He d d describes it. Uh, and then he references this guy, W.A. Sibley. And he says in a footnote, so I'm resting this case on a footnote, but you know, I, I, don't, I, th I think there's other ways to make it fit. Uh, in a footnote, Rawls says, Sibley's account of the reasonable is broader but consistent with that expressed by the two basic aspects of being reasonable used in the text. Now, just to remind you of what those two aspects are, you're, uh, for Rawls, if you're re to be reasonable, you're willing to propose and honor fair terms of cooperation, and you're willing to recognize the burdens of judgment and accept their consequences. Okay. So, then, in this same footnote, uh, where Rawls you know, begins the footnote by saying, Sibley's basically saying what I'm saying, I just have a particular conception of what he's saying. He then just quotes Sibley. So Sibley says, so, so Sibley makes this distinction between rational people and reasonable people. And what we want are people that are both rational and reasonable. Those are two different dimensions. A rational person, knowing that people are rational, we do not know the ends they will pursue, only that they will pursue them intelligently. Well, what that looks like to me is people with private wills, with particular interests. And then, Sibley then says, knowing that people are reasonable where others are concerned, we know that they are willing to govern their conduct by a principle from which they and others can reason in common. And reasonable people take into account the consequences of their actions on others' well-being. The disposition to be reasonable is neither derived from nor opposed to the rational. Those things can come together. I think that's basically Rousseau's story. <laughs> that, uh, you know, he, he just has this, you know, Sibley has this analog to the, con the common interest here. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think the idea is that uh, the reasonable for Rawls and for Sibley is the reasonable folks are the folks who are able to mediate their particular interests with this common interest. All right. That's, that's all the hard work that we're going to do. I think that leaves us with some abiding questions that I think could be you know, things that we could pursue in the summer school. What is the most satisfactory fine-grained articulation of the value of democratic solidarity? Uh, you know, we need to say a lot more about like, the institutional or the procedural embodiment of the general will. A lot of political philosophers are trying to do that sort of thing. We need to say a lot more about the content of the general will. Like, what is it? We, we, we need to get beyond Rousseau's idea that, well, it's what's left <laughs> once you remove the checks and minuses of the private interests. Uh, I think one way to think about Rawls is Rawls is taking us a long way to an account of this content, the content of the general will. Uh, and then here's a question. Uh, is the idea of the value of democracy
democratic solidarity, I, just, I think I just got it out there on the table, is it cogent and coherent at the end of the day? And if it is, what is its relative priority uh, in the constellation of political moral values? And then, remember that bit where part of the summer school and part of what I've been trying to do is kind of understand what's been happening in the last 40 years or so? Well, does this value help us understand what's going on? You know, not the only lens, but one way of looking at it. Have we recently m witnessed a marked decay in many political communities' solidaristic capacity? Uh, it, it, do we have the erosion of democratic norms as the ascendance of Hegel's shameless men? Is this the people that, that what they, you know, and it's not just Trump, it's you know, 40 years of folks that are just cultivating this capacity, are, are, are cultivating this disposition to impose their particular wills on the group. Uh, is, is that a good way to understand what's happened in the last 40 years? If so, then maybe a way to combat it is to well, do this solidaristic political philosophy thing. And then finally, is realizing democratic solidarity feasible? What are the impediments to its realization? Rousseau had some ideas, Marx had some ideas, uh, Alan Thomas had some ideas, Bill Edmondson had some ideas about this. Uh, uh, how, how can we go about improving existing solidaristic institutions and maybe designing new ones? Uh, perhaps property owning democracy, perhaps liberal market, so, uh, ah, I keep doing this, liberal democratic socialism. Uh, uh, and, yeah, the, yeah the, you can't drop the democratic. Uh, and then, what are the paths and obstacles to implementation? All right. <laughs>